A DVT is when you have a clot stuck in the deep veins of the leg. The most common veins affected by this is going to be the iliac, the femoral, and the popliteal veins. Sometimes DVTs are called VTE, but they're not the same thing. VTE actually encompasses DVT. VTE stands for venous thromboembolism, and it's actually a DVT and a PE, which means pulmonary embolism. So both a DVT and a PE are types of venous thromboembolisms. The person at risk for getting a DVT is someone who has something called stasis of blood. This means the blood is not moving, and this can include anyone who's immobile, like a post-operative patient, an obese patient, pregnant, old, heart failure, and patients with varicose veins. All of these conditions cause the blood to not flow as well. The next thing that can increase the chance of getting a DVT is something called hypercoagulability, which means the blood is very likely to clot. This includes anyone who's dehydrated because the blood gets thicker, high altitudes, or contraceptives, smoking, and something called polycythemia, which is when the patient makes a lot of red blood cells and the blood becomes viscous or thick. The last thing that increases the risk of getting a DVT is going to be endothelial damage to the vessel. So this includes surgeries, fractures, central line insertions, sepsis, and chemo. When these things cause damage to the endothelium of the vessel, it causes platelets to become activated and get stuck together, leading to the possibility of a DVT. Now, these risk factors are actually called Virchow's triad. That includes stasis of the blood, all right, so the blood doesn't move as well, hypercoagulability, so the blood is thick and it can clot easily, and endothelial damage, which causes the platelets to trigger and get stuck to each other. These three things is what leads to a clot or a thrombus. Now, what the patient's going to experience is a red, hot, swollen, and painful leg. This usually only happens on one side, and the patient's going to describe the pain as cramping or throbbing. There may also be some discoloration of the leg. This is especially true if they have a history of DVTs, and it's because the red blood cells start breaking down in that area, causing the changes in the pigmentation. The last sign I want you to know is something called the Homan sign. You do this by having the patient raise their leg and bend their knee while they're laying down, and then you're going to dorsiflex their foot at the ankle. So have them point their toes towards them. This is going to cause pain around their calf. And this is called a positive Homan sign. Now the other thing about the Homan sign I want you to know is that it's not reliable. It is not reliable whatsoever for indicating a DVT. And it should not be used as a diagnostic tool to conclude that there's a DVT there. If you're going to do this test, make sure you're very careful with the leg that you don't touch it too hard or massage it or move it because it can dislodge the DVT. The first thing you want to do after you see these symptoms is get a D-dimer. You do this by doing a blood draw and the D-dimer is going to show that it's elevated. This means there is a clot in the body, not necessarily the leg, just that there's a clot in the body. Now what's going to confirm the diagnosis of a DVT is a duplex ultrasound. This is going to show how the blood is moving through the veins and whether or not there is a clot there. Now, what you want to do for the patient if they have a DVT is put them on bed rest, elevate the legs above heart level, and don't massage the leg. This can cause a dislodgement of the clot that can lead to a pulmonary embolism. Now, how you prevent DVTs from occurring to begin with is going to be having the patient be mobile. So you want to make sure they ambulate and they perform leg exercises. You can also put anti-embolism stockings. Sometimes these are called TED hose stockings. Make sure there's no wrinkles when you put them. These are going to squeeze the legs and help the blood go back to the heart. You can also put SCDs on a patient. This stands for sequential compression device. And these are things that go around the leg and it inflates at different intervals to help with blood flow. Sometimes they're also called pneumatic compression devices. Anticoagulants can also be used to prevent DVTs. We'll talk about those when we talk about medical interventions. And the last thing is to make sure the patient is hydrated to prevent the blood from being viscous or thick. All right, now things you don't do. You do not want to put a pillow under the knee. This causes a decrease in blood flow. Instead, you should put the pillow close to their feet. You also want to teach the patient to avoid prolonged sitting or standing because this also decreases blood flow. You want to teach them to not wear constrictive clothing to avoid crossing their legs, and to avoid smoking. All right, now the medical interventions. Now this is what's gonna help the patient with their clot. The meds that do this are called anticoagulants, and they all end in rin ran ban The first one I wanna talk about is really common, and it's called heparin. 
Heparin is used to prevent further clots from forming. It doesn't really dissolve the clot, it just prevents worsening of the clot. You want to make sure you monitor a lab called APTT. APTT stands for Activated Partial Thromboplastin Time, and it's basically the time it takes the clot. Now, normal APTT, when you're not on heparin, is going to be 25 to 35. Some books say 30 to 40. Now, while you're on heparin, it's going to be 1.5 to 2.5 times that amount. So you would take that 25 and you would multiply times 1.5. And then you would take the 35 and you would multiply times 2.5. And that gives you the ranges. Now, if the patient's been receiving too much heparin, we want to give the antidote called protamine sulfate to reverse the effects. The patient can also have a complication with heparin called HIT, or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. HIT is an immune response to the heparin, and what happens is, when the heparin is introduced into the body, it will actually cause the activation and usage of the platelets. So the platelet, because they're being used, they begin to drop, and the body starts forming clots. These clots can go anywhere. They can go to the leg and cause a DVT. They can go to the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism. They can go to the heart and cause a myocardial infarction. So in order to prevent this from happening, we have to give a different anticoagulant. We give an anticoagulant called Argatroban, which is the treatment for HIT. One last thing to note is that we're not really worried about the low platelet count. Normal platelet count is around 150 to 400,000, and HIT causes it to drop to around 60,000. This is not enough for the patient to have significant bleed and for us to worry about the bleeding. Instead, your worry with HIT is that the patient can develop clots. Another anticoagulant that can be given is warfarin. Warfarin is also introduced at the same time as heparin. Now, heparin is used for acute treatment, so it's going to be used in the hospital. But patients will still need anticoagulation even after they leave the hospital, which is what warfarin is for. Warfarin is a pill that causes anticoagulation, but it takes some time to work, which is why the heparin and the warfarin are given at the same time. Now, warfarin works differently than heparin. Warfarin stops vitamin K, which is a coagulation factor. You need vitamin K to clot. Now, we use a lab called INR, which stands for International Normalized Ratio. It's just another lab to tell how long it takes the blood to clot, but it's used for warfarin. Now, normal INR is going to be a 1.1 while you're not on warfarin. While you're on warfarin, it should be 2 to 3. This is also called therapeutic levels. While the patient's on warfarin, you also want to teach them to intake a consistent amount of vitamin K. The foods that have the most vitamin K are green leafy. So you want to teach the patient to eat a consistent amount of green leafy vegetables. If the patient ends up having too much warfarin in their body, we can give the antidote which is vitamin K. There's also other anticoagulants that can be used to prevent DVTs, such as enoxaparin, dabigatran, and rivaraxaban. Look how they all end in rin, ran, and ban. You should also be aware of complementary alternative therapy. Sometimes patients can be on herbs that cause bleeding. Now, the herbs that cause bleeding all start with G. So ginseng, ginkgo, ginger, garlic. You want to make sure the provider is notified that the patient is taking these. Some of the nursing interventions that you have to do while the patient's on anticoagulants are bleeding precautions. Now, the mnemonic I like to use to remember bleeding precautions is RANDY. RANDY needs a soft bristled toothbrush. RANDY stands for razors have to be electric. You want to avoid rectal, so no suppositories, no enemas, because they can bleed easily. No NSAIDs, like aspirin, ibuprofen, or naproxen, because these also cause bleeding. You want to decrease needles, so decrease the amount of IVs, IM, or subcutaneous injections that you do. And you want to protect the patient from injury, so you want to prevent falls. You want to pad sharp corners in the room, and you want to use paper tape. The last part of Randy is that Randy needs a soft bristled toothbrush. Soft bristled toothbrush will prevent the gums from bleeding. All right, so there's some surgical intervention that can be done in case the patient can't receive anticoagulants, and that's a vena cava filter. This is inserted and it catches the clot. Now there's a risk for dislodgement, and it's not preferred over anticoagulants. It's only used if the patient has a contraindication to anticoagulants. There's a very serious complication that can happen to a patient with a DVT. It's called a pulmonary embolism. This is a clot stuck in the arteries of the lungs. How this happens is the patient has a DVT, 
The clot then dislodges and it goes into the lung causing a pulmonary embolism. The patient's going to have a sudden onset of chest pain and shortness of breath, very sudden. You want to get a CT scan done to see if there's a clot in the lungs. And then you want to get the patient started on anticoagulants, thrombolytics like TPA, or have an embolectomy done. All right, guys, that's everything you need for DVT.